Good afternoon and welcome to the Notes from the Field in Interactive Exchange on Equity and Education in 2020 and Beyond. This is a community conversation with the Equity and Inclusion Fellows at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. This event is happening in partnership with Harvard Common Spaces. Find out more about upcoming events at their website, commonspaces.harvard.edu. My name is Cassandra Baptiste, and I will be the moderator for this interactive experience. I encourage audience members to use the Q&A section to put their questions uh, in the chat area, in the Q&A chat area, where we also have moderators who will help to make sure that the questions are asked in an orderly fashion. On behalf of the entire Harvard community, I welcome Misha Ross Porter of New York City Public Schools. Misha is the Executive Superintendent for the Bronx. Dr. Jamie Hitchcock, who is the Superintendent for Oak Park Schools in the greater Detroit area within Oakland County. And Sophia Mendoza, who will be joining us shortly. She is from uh, Los Angeles Unified School District and is the Director for Instructional Technology Initiatives at the Los Angeles Unified School District. I thought that it would be really helpful to have background information about our panelists, as this will also help uh, with those in the Q&A section who have specific questions for our panelists. And so I will begin with Misha Ross Porter. She currently serves at the, as the Bronx Executive Superintendent, where she is invested in deepening school leaders' equity lens and building collaborative practices across schools. Prior to taking the helm as the Bronx Executive Superintendent, Misha served as Superintendent for Community District 11 and Principal of the Bronx School for Law, Government, and Justice. Misha received, and here is our flyer, <laughs> um, Misha received, um, apologies, Misha served as the community coordinator, internship coordinator, and taught English before becoming an assistant principal and then taking helm as principal in 2004. Having worked her way up through the ranks, she's exceedingly aware of the challenges schools face and has dedicated her life to improving the learning environment for all students. Misha also believes that if, student lead if school leaders, teachers, and parents focus on empowering students to achieve their unique individual potential, they will be prepared to meet the demands of the 21st century. We welcome Misha Ross Porter. We also have Dr. Jamie Hitchcock. Jamie Hitchcock, PhD is the superintendent of Oak Park Schools located in an Oakland County suburb on the border of Detroit, Michigan. She has worked as a teacher and administrator for over 20 years at the pre-K to grade 12 level. She began her career as a high school language arts teacher and basketball coach. Soon after, she became dean of students and assistant principal at schools that have been recognized annually as top high schools in the country by Newsweek and US News and World Report. She previously served as the principal of an international baccalaureate world school and as principal of a comprehensive elementary school. While serving as principal, Dr. Hitchcock was invited to join the Harvard Graduate School of Education over a series of summers to work with the professional education K-12 program staff in closing the achievement gap, strategies for excellence with equity and family engagement in education, and creating effective home and school partnerships for student success programs. We welcome the two panelists and are so excited for Ms. Mendoza to join. And I'll ask Zach if you can take off the flyer and have the panelists at the center. All right, awesome. So we are going to begin and I'll ask for panelists to um, you feel free to unmute yourselves and join in on the conversation. The first question that we have for tonight is really just in centering on positivity, considering the level of calamity that we've experienced due to COVID-19. What is it that you're most proud of in your district or community in this time? Who are some of the people, places, and things that are just making you so proud in your school community? And we'll start with Nisha. Okay. Or, oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Hitchcock. No, no, you go. 
<laughs> I can't wait to hear what's happening in the Bronx. I can't wait to hear what's happening with you, honey. <laughs> we, we are similar sisters, I can tell already. Yes. Uh, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm really just proud of the people. First, um, the students that are, you know, in the Bronx that are so resilient and often have to be but are showing up in so many amazing ways um, as we all in the, in the spirit of really understanding and unpacking equity, um, you know, the Bronx is the brownest borough in New York City and has been disproportionately affected by this virus um, in similar ways to in which we've been disproportionately affected by a lot of different things. And so first the young people, the teachers who have become remote online, folks in 24 hours um, with, with little opportunity to get prepared and are learning as they go. Um, every single principal in the Bronx, but in New York City, who I already did all kinds of things to make sure kids had what they needed before they left school, teachers had what they needed, um, and really the community, right? Like, so this is a moment for us to really come together as a community, elected officials, business owners, um, your neighbors. Um, and I keep telling people, this is a great moment for good old fashioned community, right? Like the, the greatest emails and calls I've gotten have been from other parents who are saying, my neighbor doesn't have a device. One of the students has an IEP and is struggling. Can you help me? And they're always super apologetic. And I'm like, no, please reach out. And so I think that this is a moment um, and the organization I lead, um, besides the, the 305 schools in the Bronx, but the Bronx Borough Office, the folks that support our schools, um, all of the education administrators, professional development folks who have also become experts in this space really quickly. And so I'm just proud of the way people have stepped up. These are scary times. Um, these are, these are, this is a moment that doesn't know race, doesn't know gender, doesn't know sexuality, um, but disproportionality knows what it knows. So we are all experiencing a level of suffering and the way in which people have stepped up and wrapped themselves around um, children is, has really just been amazing to me. I could not, I cannot agree more. Um, we're in a unique situation in Oak Park in that we're on the border of Detroit, which is in Wayne County, which is one of the hardest hit areas in the nation in terms of COVID-19 cases and deaths. In addition, in the county that we sit in, which is Oakland County, we had the highest number of cases per capita of COVID-19. You combine that with having about 99% of our population being African American, and we have suffered from tremendous grief and loss. But what has been amazing is the way people have stepped up. Um, there are people in our school district that I don't believe always receive the notoriety that they should. Uh, food service workers, bus drivers, security staff, um, technicians in terms of laptop technicians, all of those folks have truly stepped up because they are essentially on the front line. They're providing meals every day. We have uh, a pretty small school district, but we provide over 13,000 meals weekly to families in our area and in the Detroit area that would not otherwise have food to eat. We have partnered with a local hospital um, and they have truly become heroes, which is part of a great story. Um, the silver lining in this is the recognition that they've received for the work that they do. But we're providing medical care and mental health care. Um, and that's only possible through the partnership with the local hospital to do that. Um, we have been provided with support by United Way, which is also a community member. The, the hospital uh, uh, facility, I'm sorry, I already said that, the public safety facility, the police have stepped up. We have been bartering with them, like if you give us masks, we'll give you uh, cleaning supplies. It's been remarkable to see how people have truly come together, even though our staff has been disproportionately impacted personally mm -hmm. by COVID-19. Yeah, can I just add that just to Dr. Hitchcock's point, those unsung heroes, 
I, I'm most, I'm so proud of this moment that allows us to value all people in a different way. You know, we are a society, you know, the internet society that the, 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 the you know, Snapchat, Twitter, you know, instant gratification in a moment society where we often just pass people by. The, the, the lady packing your groceries in the supermarket, the crossing guard on the street, the, the, the folks in the cafeteria who prepare your meals every day, the school safety agents, you know, the custodians that are there. And so I just think this is such a moment for us to really value people and know when I was a principal, I would say everybody in this building is a teacher, you know? And so this is a moment to give value to every single person um, and, and help even, even those people who don't always feel important understand what they add to a community and how important and essential each and every one of them are. Absolutely. And it, this has changed the meaning of community. Mm -hmm. And now joining our community is Ms. Sophia Mendoza from Los Angeles Unified. Welcome. Can you hear us? Yes. Hello? Sophia? We cannot hear you. You are muted. Oh no. <laughs> Vanessa may have to unmute for us to hear. And also share audio. So there we go. Well, as Sophia is joining us, I do want to share who she is and what she does and all the amazing things that are happening in Los Angeles Unified. Sofia Mendoza is an innovative systems level collaborator with over 20 years of experience as an educational leader in Los Angeles Unified. She was a student in Los Angeles Unified, a teacher, an assistant principal, a principal, and now a district level leader um, where she oversees the implementation of computer science education and digital citizenship programs across over 1300 schools. Um, and she was named a next generation leader by Ed Scoop and also in 2018 awarded the most influential person in ed tech by tech and learning. Uh, there's just been so many awards and honors that she's received not only for her work with um, education technology, but bringing centering equity and education technology and in conversations that I've had with her, I like to coin it techwity. Um, and so I'm just so happy that she's here. And once she has her audio on, um, please join in, in the, on the conversation. Um, Okay, yes, I can hear you. Um, let me see if I can put gallery view and I'm hoping that um, Zach, if you can help with uh, gallery view on our end as well so that all the members of the audience can still see panelists. Sophia, can, can you speak and maybe we can try to see if we hear you? Hi, good afternoon and good evening. Awesome. Um, and so one with one thing that we're starting off with is what are you most proud of within your community at this time? Wow, there are so many things that I am just in awe of and proud to share. Um, the first and foremost is that our district made the commitment to keep our schools open and to go virtual. So there was no lag time between the announcement made on Friday, March 13th to uh, over the weekend, Monday morning, uh, schools were open virtually for our students. So I think that's a big, big commitment on behalf of our district. Um, also being able to address those basic human needs, you know, for example, providing meals, not only to the students and their families, but to anyone who um, is living within our LA Unified boundaries. I think I'm, I'm most proud of those two, but most importantly, you know, where my, where my heart and soul is always day to day is in our professional uh, development, really looking at our professional leadership, and, um, our school site educators, our teachers, how quickly they pivoted to really innovate. They stepped out of their comfort zone all the while during a global pandemic. Um, and to go back to mention our professional development, 
we quickly uh, came together as a true unified district, our division of instruction, um, as well as the various other offices and the office that I oversee, the Instructional Technology Initiative, um, really looking at what we had, take a look at what we had again, the key there, and how can we quickly pivot and shift to support our educators who really um, leaned on us hard for some support. And now we're launching a certification before school uh, ends this semester. So there's just so much that I'm proud of. Thank you so much for sharing. And we'll get back to the certification um, process. And one of the things um, with the Equity and Inclusion Fellows, we really wanted to have voices from various school districts across the country to kind of learn more of like what's happening in one district versus another and how can collaborative efforts take place where learning is continued and, and resources are shared. Um, and so we will get back to that. And I, I would like to ask my next question, but I also urge members of the audience to put questions in the Q&A area so it can be as interactive as possible. So in a New York Times article, it was stated that for many schools closed in March and effectively um, the majority of the students will be returning to school in the fall without the skills and without the concepts that they were meant to achieve or master in the spring. What does educational and instructional leadership look like in what I call the now normal? And I'll ask Dr. Hitchcock to start. Sure. Thank you. Um, what I would say what it looks like in the now normal is that our focus is on compassion and social emotional support first. We surveyed our families and over 20% of our families indicated that their child has experienced grief or loss during this school closure. So when we return to school, whenever that may be, our focus will be on social emotional support of students and building relationships. It, depending on how things go, because it's hard to tell, we haven't made a decision about what our fall school year will look like yet, but what we are thinking about is giving students opportunity for closure with their previous teacher unless they're in a transition year, because students, as you know, uh, if it's similar to what happened here in the Detroit area, one day school closed, we all had to pack up and we walked away and everything is still sitting the way it was the day before we left. So we feel like students need uh, some time to have closure with their teachers to understand what is happening next face to face with people that they trust and they're familiar with when they return to school and hopefully that they've been in contact with throughout this school closure. Um, following that period, the emphasis will be on this summer program that we are working hard to put together to try to do our best to fill some gaps. We have made an effort to develop a hybrid model, which would include students coming to school to get interventions, uh, as well as doing some online learning for the summer. Over 60% of our families surveyed indicated that they did not feel comfortable sending their children to school at this time. So we've decided to strictly go online, but to do so in small group settings where we have provided every single child in our school district with a laptop or hotspot who's identified that they do not have access to one at home. So our goal is to stay in contact with them and try to do our best to fill those gaps as much as possible uh, over the summer months. In the event, we know that students are gonna return and there are gonna be holes in their learning. So while emphasizing the value and importance of social emotional support, the next step truly will be giving teachers some autonomy to review and reteach to meet students where they are. We'll have some additional uh, research-based interventions. We're lucky enough to have full-time support in our buildings as academic interventionists, as Title I interventionists and specialists, uh, reading specialists, literacy coaches, uh, full-time sites, social workers at every level of our school district. All of those folks will be working hard to fill in those gaps uh, when we return to school to do our best. But then really supporting 
our staff with the process of the unknown. There may be things that we have to work together to figure out that we don't have the answers to, but to try to maintain that collaborative spirit and give staff grace, autonomy, and make sure that their voices and the voices of our students are included in the decision making. Thank you so much. I would like to ask Ms. Misha Ross Porter to add on because you ended with students and from what I know, students are at the heart of everything that she does and everything that's happening in the Bronx. And so take it away. So I am excited to be on with these two amazing women because um, I can tell that we are like-minded folks. And, you know, for us, it's like Dr. Hitchcock said, the, the, the social, meeting the social emotional needs of our students, but meeting the social emotional needs of all of the folks returning to the building, right? So our students left and they left their teachers and they left their things and they left that pen where they left it. They left that book where they left it, right? Um, but our teachers also left. And we've also experienced losses, both personally and professionally in our school communities, that we haven't had the time or space to grieve in, in, in the, grieving is so unnatural, and I'm at, add this to the, the natural course of grieving. And so definitely thinking about how are we responding to the social emotional needs of our students, but also responding to the social emotional needs of the adults in the building, while also thinking about how do we leverage this moment, moment to get tech smart and tech savvy, right? Like you have to think about what is the opportunity presented to us in this moment. And so folks have, myself included, like I've got comfortable Zooming and Teaming in a way that I was not comfortable two months ago. And so really, how are we going to leverage technology differently? You know, we are still in school and like LA, really proud that, you know, we, we were able to keep our doors virtually open and our classrooms virtually open for our students. But what I like to say um, is every student in New York City, every student across this country, every student affected by this pandemic is a student with interrupted formal education as a SIFE student. And so how can we take the lessons of that work, that body of work, and incorporate it into our practice? How can we become better educators um, as a result of this moment when it comes to meeting the social emotional needs, the, the work around? It's so interesting, you know, all of the feedback we get from students connects back to, and they're probably kids who before this in started were like, Jesus, if I could just go home. If I could just learn from home, my life would be better. I don't want to come here every day. But the thing that they are saying over and over again is the greatest moments they have are the moments when they get to see their teacher live, are the moments when they get to connect with their classmates live. And so how are we going to leverage this moment to learn how to do just that, whether it is in the classroom or remotely? And so I'm looking to leveraging lessons, the research around online learning speaks to student engagement. It speaks directly to how we are engaging students in learning. And so we're looking at those lessons around how you engage in high quality online learning. We're looking at how we leverage tech, but undergirding all of that is meeting the social emotional needs of all students, families, you know, um, teachers, principals who have had the heavy load of managing much of the grief, right? And sharing those messages and sharing that news while also trying to lead the day-to-day -day of school. And so that, that's what I'm really thinking about. How do we leverage this moment to really learn, which is at the heart of the work that we do as educators is to really be lead learners. Excellent. I'm pivoting with that question to Sophia in regards to leveraging learning and experiences that increase engagement, but in an online fashion, but also within if thinking of the transition back to schools. So, you know, one of the things I mean, I, I everything that Dr. Porter and Dr. Hitchcock are mentioning, I just resonates so much with me, especially around that social emotional piece. So really looking at how leadership can be human centered, you know, taking that approach that recognizing that our learners are, are already before this crisis happened, we're at different places. And 
understand how are we going to meet them where they are first. So, you know, if nothing else comes out of this crisis, you know, I'm hoping that leaders now see, when I'm talking about leaders, I'm talking about that classroom leader, that principal leader, that central office leader, because I truly, really believe all of us in education are leaders, um, and that we see how critical our role is becoming advocates for equity and citizenship really ensuring that all of our learners have skilled educators, you know, really um, tying it back to what our previous panelists mentioned, making sure that we're skilled and that we're actively leveraging technology to truly teach in ways that are culturally relevant. We have like this great opportunity to reinvent how we approach really those deep embodied systemic inequities that you know we see and now we have to hit that head on knowing that and shame on us if we don't have that hard conversation as we start to um, reinvent these opportunities when we do come back into um, the brick and mortar or right now you know so that, that's a challenge that I want to put out there to my fellow colleagues, um, all of the leadership that is uh, listening today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a question from the audience. Uh, Nathan Stauffer asks, in recognition of the gaps that students will bring into the next school year, how will the standardized measures of student achievement, particularly statewide assessments, be impacted? And I will start with Nisha. So in New York, our assessments have been suspended for this year. And again, like I'm, I'm, I look at this as an opportunity to really think about how are we approaching standards-based instruction, right? How are we thinking differently about learning? And I, I am a true believer that like if we build the skills that students need to be critical thinkers, readers, writers, mathematicians, then they can master any assessment uh, put Put it their way but you know there are some decisions that have to be made about where assessments will sit at this moment and what they will look like um and those decisions are still being made but again this is opportunity for us to think differently think differently about how we grade think differently about how we give feedback to students think differently about how we you know approach student learning from the perspective of how do we help students grow and be smarter? What are we telling them about what they were learning? How are we quantifying and qualifying this differently than a number, but giving clear actionable feedback and next steps to help students move? Um, and, and I think at the end of that, like if we can do that well, if we can begin to really do that well, they'll be ready for whatever assessments come their way. I, I don't want educators, and I, I fear this, educators are worried so much about not about this loss in terms of, well, what about next year when the test comes back? And let's, let's really take this moment to be focused on how are we building learners? How are we helping our students know what, what they need to know to grow, um, to, to again, become critical thinkers, readers, writers, mathematicians, and all of the things that we want them to be. They can get the answer to anything on Google, right? Like, you can Google most anything, um, but we want them to be able to unpack, um, dissect, inspect. And so I just think that this is a moment and we can't be stuck with what about that test next year or what about when that test comes back? Um, we have to think about what makes us all really smart and what makes us really smart is our ability to, to do all of those things with information. Absolutely. We have a question from one of the law students. Um, who would like to know more about addressing the needs for low income students um, and really just from a nationwide perspective that more than 3 million US students don't have internet at home. And so how are educators uh, going about addressing this um, concern? And I'll ask Dr. Hitchcock to join in on that. Okay, so in our area, that is a significant issue. Um, we had to really grapple with how to best support our students. And what's tricky is, unlike other communities, 60% uh, of our population comes from Detroit, which is a neighboring district through a Schools of Choice program. The other 40% uh, 
actually live in the Oak Park area, which is a suburb, a small suburb of Detroit that only consists of about 30,000 people. So there are some districts that are able to put internet on the buses and deploy the buses in certain areas. If you know anything about Detroit, it is a huge space. And so we were unable to provide that level of support. So we had to partner with our cellular service provider and provide hotspots to families as well as repurpose our school laptops. So we've, we're lucky enough to be in a state where the governor really has an understanding of the varying needs of uh, students in our state, from students who really struggle financially to students that um, don't have those financial struggles. And she's made a commitment to equity in the state and done a very good job of it. Throughout that process, we've been able to repurpose uh, our funding for new technology and equipment for the fall, which means that we were able to provide our students with our current technology to take home and to keep home in many cases because we're not sure how frequently or when they'll be able to return. So we provided laptops to all of our students as well as hotspots to all of our students, anyone that needed it. Um, it did come at a significant cost, believe it or not. Hot, the cost of hotspots is just uh, outrageous. Um, but we thought it was important to maintain that connection to the school district to provide support. My understanding is that there has been an uptick of sexual abuse during this time. There has been uh, sexual abuse reported by students, by, by children. Um, because of them, because they're suffering at home and they're not in a school environment where trusted adults could typically call for them. We, w we felt, again, on that social emotional level, a connection needs to be maintained to trusted adults for the purpose of social emotional support, but also abuse, neglect, any other um, support that we could provide in addition to uh, educational opportunities during this time. Yeah. This is a really trying time and it requires the best and the brightest. Uh, yes, the best and the brightest. We, we, we are at Harvard, but we're also at state schools, HBCUs, community schools, in the community themselves. Um, and so the follow-up question to, to what we just left off with Dr. Hitchcock and, and previous comments, um, what are the technical and adaptive qualities of the leaders that, that you believe that leaders who should be supporting in districts, what, do, what are their technical and adaptive qualities? And I ask this question because so many are graduating and they're going off into school leadership, but we also have many who are aspiring to become teachers, aspiring to go into education, especially at this time. So considering all the things that have happened in the last few weeks, what are those qualities? Not just technical, but adaptive. And we'll have uh, Ms. Mendoza join in. Great. Thank you so much. Um, again, thank you everyone for working behind the scenes. I really appreciate this. Um, one area that I would like to really highlight and something that has helped us in LA Unified really set what might be those adaptive skills and dispositions uh, are found in the ISTE standards for students. It's a very comprehensive um, framework designed for students, educators, and education leaders. Uh, everything from how can I be a creative communicator? How can I be an empowered learner? Uh, also for our education leaders, really looking at, you know, earlier I mentioned the notion and the concept around being an advocate for equity and citizenship. How can I be that visionary leader, that planner, and that systems level approach. So um, I'm so glad I'm able to have this conversation with higher ed partners because this has um, truly been an area to bridge these global skills and dispositions around what we want to see in our leaders that are coming into the K-12 space. So one area I would really like to encourage 
everyone to explore uh, are the ISTE standards, the entire suite, everything from our students, from our educators, and to our educator leaders. And you'll really find something that resonates with you as a leader in whatever role or context you are in that will really set the stage and that foundation for that um, modern or contemporary type of um, learning that we're all wanting to reimagine together. And Nisha, thank you, Sophia. So I would say uh, technical is really like the, these different, the varying systems. So leveraging the standards, um, leveraging the tools, but also like learning how to use these technical systems and really modeling them from a leadership perspective. And so, um, and, and some of my folks would probably call me out because I haven't been a leader in that space, but you know, like, you know, how are you leveraging various platforms to create different kinds of learning spaces for students. Um, how are you doing that for the adults that you lead? How are you doing that as a school leader? Um, and so I actually think this next generation of leaders who have probably grown up in this space are going to be better prepared for the technical parts of this. I mean, I can't tell you how many people, I'm like, just send me the links, just let me click. If I could just click and get where I need to go, I'm fine. But if I got into codes and figure things out and like go behind the scenes and, remote, I, just send me the link, right? Like that's who I am. Um, and so there's, I think the, that there's so many more uh, folks that are coming up in the ranks that are really prepared for the technical, technical part of it. The adaptive part is what we were thrown into. The adaptive part is be prepared for change. Be comfortable with, right? Like sit in your discomfort and know that you are going to sit there for a minute, right? Do not stop counting on what's going to happen in September. Start planning for what you want to have happen and then have the other plan. Right. And so it is like that, that, that uh, non-negotiable that speaks to being comfortable with discomfort, I think is the, the most adaptive space that we can be in right now because none of, we don't know what to, I am an avid cable news watcher and I have had to stop. Because they keep telling me the same thing every day. I just want somebody to tell me school's going to be open in September. Well, nobody's going to tell me that, right? Like every day things are changing and every day things are staying the same. And so for leaders, for teachers, we have to sit in that discomfort of this moment. We have to learn from the discomfort of this moment. We have to be learners in this moment, be grateful for the time and space that we have to learn. And so how are you leveraging the opportunity to build up those technical skills? But... I think the most adaptive space we can sit in is to just know that you cannot determine tomorrow, um, but you can get prepared for, you know, it, this will pass. We will get back to school. There will be a new normal. Um, and so what does that, this is a moment to dream. And so adaptively, I would be a real dreamer in this moment about what my, what should my school look like? If I am a principal, if I'm a teacher, if I'm a district level leader, what should my district look like? What should my school look like? What should my classroom look like, right? And how am I leveraging everyone, every single person to build that new place, which is a combination of brick and mortar and remote and virtual and all kinds of learning experiences. And how are we leveraging young people who are so far ahead of us in this space and moment? That brings me to Dr. Sean Jenright um, in the Oakland Bay Area, who writes about dreaming and curriculum and dreams are free. And that's what we have to innovate and move forward. And I really thank you so much for sharing your viewpoint on that. Um, I want to get a question from the audience. I see Victoria Dadage in the Q&A area, and I literally was highlighting your name the other day. She's a mentor, a dear friend, haven't seen her in a long time, but what, when I mentioned technical and adaptive, this is a leader who I, I want to highlight and share her question, which is for any of the panelists, in what ways have you seen school leaders and educators foster an inclusive online learning environment? Any concrete examples? How much of a role is there a balance between synchronous and asynchronous really impacts students from your perspective? So now we're getting, we're getting deeper into some of this technical 
Um, but that's the question from Victoria Dadaj. Any concrete examples of students just thriving in the online space? We've had uh, some discussion in our district about students with IEPs. Um, in some cases, our students with autism have been thriving in this environment. Uh, and we, we understand that part of the challenge is that social challenge, so they may feel more comfortable in this online learning environment. But our thought is how can we leverage their success during remote learning to ensure that when we return to school, their classmates, their teachers, see the value in what they have to offer in the classroom setting, even though they have some unique needs that exist. I think that in this particular case, students are able to shine in a way that they have not been able to in the past because of some of those challenges. So I think it's incumbent upon us to, to be innovative, like my partners in crime have said here, to be innovative about what it is we can do to leverage the strengths and talents that we've seen in our students during this time. Students have been, I'm going to tell you, they have completed courses on their cell phones before we were able to distribute laptops to students. They've completed entire papers or assignments on their cell phones. Our young people have the capacity to adapt and to take risks, and we have to ensure that we are um, encouraging our teachers who like things to typically be in a nice, neat box to think outside of the box and take risks um, with all that they're able to offer our kids. And we've seen more evidence of risk taking during this time period than I think we see during the, a typical school year. Um, and in large part, that's come becomes because they've been sort of forced to do it. If you haven't learned how to use Google Classroom before, well, guess what? You have to learn how to do that now um, because there's no other choice if you want to truly communicate with students in a way to provide the most optimal online learning uh, experience for them. So I think that in some cases they've been forced to do those things and that is healthy because we need them to take a step out of their comfort zones and to do those things. And luckily their compassion and drive for educating kids has uh, prevailed over their fear of certain types of technology. Um, and the other thought is people just have to, you have to uh, pivot right now um, in terms of how to maintain inclusive environments because you never know what could happen. So one of our students' hotspots could go down and they may not have one. So we're looking at leveraging cable news channels to ensure that we reach a certain demographic of families in our community. So it really is about, is similar to that last question around adapting, but pivoting um, and being having a willingness and desire to do whatever it takes to meet the needs of the students that you have in front of you. Thank you so much. I also want to ask about English language learners um, and bring uh, Sophia in on that end. I've heard her speak about just so much asset-based learning and engagement. And yes, that serves for English language learners, it serves for all students. Um, so I would like to bring you into the fold for that. And I wanna be respectful of the time for the panelists that they've dedicated. So maybe if there are any more questions in the Q&A, put it there and I'll have my last question and we'll close out. All right, Sophia. Great, thank you so much, Cassandra. Yes, um, in LA Unified, you know, 73% of our students are Latino, 8% are African-American. Uh, so our English language learners, we want to make, you know, make sure that we're reaching our English language learners where they are. One of the areas that we've overlapped our work is in the area of computer science to support our English language learners as we start to develop language because, you know, as we see also in computer science, some of the computational thinking and coding really does tails to learning new languages. Uh, so one area that we're seeing just really spark interest for our learners is in the area of 
uh, computer science where we're seeing spikes in our students participating in areas in Minecraft, for example, really exploring those creative spaces to be able to have those opportunities to communicate with one another, test out those language um, assets that they're already bringing to the experience that they're having, also in creativity in the area of scratch. You know, a lot of our educators were already using these uh, very, uh, we like to call them low floor, high ceiling uh, platforms where students can get engaged, but at the same time really build upon. Yes, um, we may think we on the surface they're playing, but there's so much language, rich language that our students are already bringing. And that creativity piece is so critical to that asynchronous and synchronous question we received earlier to making sure that our students are engaged in those various parallel tracks that will bring them into this conversation, especially for um, our, not only our students with disabilities, but our English language learners. Absolutely. Um, and I think that answers, there's one of the questions, which is as a researcher involved in research on K through 12 STEM education equity, what are the thoughts on the impact that this shift has made to virtual learning that, you know, that then has an impact on the landscape of tech and STEM literacy in schools going forward? And I think that's top of mind for everyone on this panel. Um, and Sophia alluded to, you know, a lot of that just now. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question on how is all of the data being gathered about what's working and what's not working and finding ways to scale about bringing um, these are some bright spots and bringing those bright spots to scale. And I'll start with Nisha. We're looking at a lot of data in New York. I mean, we're looking at student engagement data. We're looking at um, interactions between teachers and students. And we, one, I'm so proud because I was really initially worried about like, where, where are our babies? Like, where are they? And so we are really proud to say that we've connected with 99% of the students in the Bronx. Um, and so now we're looking at what's the impact of those connections, right? And so we, we are also monitoring um, daily interactions. We're also monitoring, uh, we just did a survey of families and students on how they're experiencing it. So how they're experiencing remote learning. And so we've heard a lot about, we got the devices, we got the materials, we feel connected. And so to the resources that um, my colleagues have mentioned, how do we go deeper into the learning space, right? And so again, teachers have done an amazing job of jumping in, but how do we really move to a place where we are where students are experiencing some of what they have experienced in a classroom, some of that synchronous learning, how do we get that happening more often? And I think that, you know, we've gotten a lot of feedback around like when students find joy in this moment, our, you know, support team people, I didn't shout out our school aides, our parent coordinators, our paraprofessionals, um, our attendance folks at the borough office are doing wellness checks and they're calling students to say, how are you? You know, is everything okay? Do you need anything? And so, you know, to, to our earlier point of like, just, you know, our, we have this conversation in New, York, in New York City and we are often wondering how are the children? And that's gotta be our first kind of starting point. Do we know how the children are? Um, and if they are well, then we can teach them. And so I, that's where we are. We are monitoring all kinds of data, right? Like there are all kinds of different pieces of data that can inform the work that we're doing. And so we are doing a lot of that with an emphasis on how is this leading to student learning. Thank you so much. Um, I, again, want to be respectful of time. I have two questions. One is, what are each of you doing for your own collective self-care? And that's from Tracy Jones, who asked that question earlier. And then my um, second question is going to close out with, what are, we, what are we most hopeful for? But let's start with that self-care. Self-care for me has really been about staying connected with my colleagues. Um, you know, we're used to seeing each other every morning and every afternoon, evening. Uh, so being really connected with the central office team that really keeps me grounded um, at work and here at home, you know, trying to just do some stretches, get on the stationary bike, um, take some moments just to breathe. 
Um, those are just a couple of things that I've found handy, but thank you for asking. That, that really means a lot. Thank you. Dr. Hitchcock. Um, I'm not very good at this. I'm going to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, not really good at this at all, but what we did do is a series of mindfulness professional learning for our leaders in the district. It included our district administrators as well as our building leaders. Uh, we provided additional trauma informed care training that starts with self for our administrators and we're carrying that on to our staff. We have created a Google doc that is called um, Finding Joy During COVID-19 and people post a variety of ideas there. We've had uh, a happy hour, a karaoke. We've tried to do some really fun things as a group um, but my own self-care, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I, I'm not that good at it, but I would, I would echo what Sophia said about uh, just staying connected to your team during this time and being able to laugh at things and um, not take things too seriously uh, as we're all experiencing this very difficult time. So I am a very social butterfly. Um, I come from a really big family. And so that has been hard, you know, like my hangout crew and my brothers and sisters and, and colleagues and friends that I work with. And so I've done a lot of uh, virtual Zoom happy hours, Zoom karaoke, um, a Zoom 50th birthday party. Um, I, Zoom could be a little crazy. <laughs> um, I also have like found my green thumb again. And so, you know, like we work so much, we spend so many hours outside our home. Um, and so, you know, I haven't had live plants much here in a long time. And so I brought some live plants. I got flowers all over the house. Um, and so they're just putting things around me that make me smile and make me happy. And I've been going out for walks with my, with my girls, um, you know, just, you know, exploring my own neighborhood in a different way. And so I am just really, you know, taking, I'm also a graduate, a student, a doctoral student now. And so I've also committed to shutting down, you know, this weekend, my daughter graduated from college on Saturday. She was her graduation day. Um, and so we did some celebrating and of course, Sunday was Mother's Day and I just disconnected so I could be really connected here. And I think being so connected, right? Like I thought I did a lot when I went to work and spent 10, 12 hours, right? But being connected at home is so different. And so I'm learning to disconnect so that I can be present and not take for granted that I'm home and that I'm present. Yeah. Out of this, we've learned so many skills on self-care. And um, for those of us who, who need a little more help in that area, I hope that you've learned some new tips and tricks and apply it because that's a key part of leadership as well. Um, my last question is, what are you most hopeful for? What do you hope for in this time and beyond? And anyone can start. And I'm okay with a pause of silence. Wait time as a teacher. <laughs> I will go, I am hopeful for all of the things that I talked about earlier. I'm hopeful that people are dreaming about the school they wanna have, the district they wanna have, the classroom that they wanna have. Um, I'm hopeful about, you know, students and us appreciating people in a different way, us valuing the crossing guard, the school safety agent, who's the per first person you see when you walk into a building, the parent coordinator who's checked on you, who you didn't know recognized you and remembered you, um, your neighbor. You know, I'm just, I'm hopeful for who we can be as a community, who we can be in humanity in a different way than we've been. And I'm hopeful about the slowdown, that the slowdown will help us slow down and value the things that are really important in our lives. So, um, and I am really hopeful about the other side of this because I really miss in person with my family and in person with my good friends. But this is, is, this is a good moment to really be reflective and, and um, you know, think about who we want to be. 
Um, yeah, I'm just when you asked that, just so many things came flooding, you know, my mind. Um, but I think what I'm most hopeful for is that our world leaders, and again, I think of everyone uh, as as a leader, really takes this opportunity to continue to advocate. Use your voice. Your voice is powerful wherever you might be serving or impacting our students, whether you're at the central office, you're that crossing guard that you know I wave to every morning. Um, please, you see an inequity, please use your voice um, so that we're not in this place again. Um, you know, let's link arms with our allies. You know, we may look different, we may come from different places, but let's link arms together. So, so um, honored to see my colleagues and I consider us now linked um, so that when, as we start advocating, the three of us, the four of us, we're all linked together now. So that's my biggest hope. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, my biggest hope is that we come out of this with a greater appreciation for living in the moment. Um, some of those things that we are so accustomed doing, to doing every single day, like saying hi to the crossing guard every morning and stopping to talk for a little bit and talking about, you know, their grandkids or something like that. Those are things that I have missed during this time um, because we are so separated. You know, you wonder how are those people doing that have these small impacts, this small impact on your life? Um, and you know in our area we have to think about are they safe are they healthy um and what is their experience right now i think the other thing on a, a national scale is i'm hopeful and believe that during this time period people have gained a greater appreciation for educators in the field of education uh, I have seen so many jokes, memes, and other things about people trying to educate their kids at home. And I believe that people have a better understanding of this is a tough job. And we need the support nationally for this profession. Um, and that now they have an opportunity to just get a glimpse of what this looks like for us on a daily basis as they're trying to navigate um, learning with their children at home. So I'm hopeful that we'll see a, a new day in our nation where people have an elevated respect for educators. I'm so grateful for this entire panel, the members of the audience, Harvard Common Spaces, my Equity and Inclusion Fellows. Thank you so much. Ms. Misha Ross Porter, Dr. Jamie Hitchcock, and Ms. Sophia Mendoza. I just appreciate you so much. And I feel like anything you do is everything you do. And so I've watched your leadership from afar and I just felt like the Harvard community needs to hear what's going on and how you're impacting the field. And my hope is that people continue to learn and continue to come together and bring back their knowledge, bring back what they know and, 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 and do good for the children. That's my hope. And I'm so grateful to, to each and every one of you. And on that note, our conversation and our time together is coming to a close. I'm wishing for everyone to be well in this time. Much love.